Clear. This is Bill from Curious Cars, or today I guess we're Curious Planes, as the case may be, uh, doing what will probably, well it's certainly my first airplane review on this channel and will almost undoubtedly be the last because, you know, quite frankly this is a car channel, but it's kind of a special event. A friend of mine for many, many years is uh, selling this airplane and he sort of asked me to do a video on it and a photo shoot and uh, that sort of thing. And I thought, you know, why the hell not? You know, let's <laughs> mix it up a little bit, have a bit of fun. And uh, so here we are, and we're going to do it, and what the hell. You know, the weather, I can't actually complain. I had planned to complain, but I can't. There's actually a lovely little cool breeze in the air. I don't know if it's just being a couple of hours north of Naples that's enough to do this, or if, you know, the weather is fair down there as well. But either way, I'm not moaning. And the thing is, it's going to be bad later. In fact, it'll be bad in about an hour. You see our tropical sun is coming up over there. Uh, but for the moment, it's actually pretty nice out, and I can't complain too much at all. Uh, it was roasting hot yesterday when I actually went up in this thing, uh, but as of right now, it's pretty damn lovely. Um, so again, first, probably last uh, airplane review. This one is going to be for sale. I'm actually going to submit it to bring a trailer just for shits and giggles. Be fun to take it to CarMax, too, and see what they offered. Uh, but uh, I don't think Frank Trail would take it. It's probably just going to end up on the plane trader or, you know, wherever the hell it is people sell airplanes. I'm going to have to figure all of that out. Um, I'm at Albert Witted Airport in St. Pete, and it's actually recognized as the birthplace of scheduled commercial aviation. I mean, uh, in 1914, actually before it officially existed, but it was in the same area, uh, it was the first scheduled airline flight, so, you know, it has a bit of an historical uh, shtick to it, and it's beloved by private pilots for its amenities, it has a great restaurant, apparently the people who work here are very nice, and uh, of course it has a terrifying water approach, as uh, I found out yesterday, uh, nice to be over the water. <clears throat> coming in, but uh, anyway, it's it's sort of a beloved uh, community airport, and you know, some people would say this airport is one of the reasons that people get into flying, you know, private planes and having fun with that sort of thing at all. It's it's just, you know, you can fly into St. Pete, you can, you're two minutes from downtown, there's a Dolly Museum over there, in fact, you can see it pretty clearly from here, that uh, domed thing. Uh, right there, the Black Dome. Yeah, there's just stuff to do. It's, you know, it's a reason that people who have private planes, as I found out, I'm, you know, it turns out a lot of my friends have done quite well and they have stuff like this, whereas I don't. Uh, so I have to count on them to tell me why. And apparently, you know, when one owns a private plane, part of the shtick is you're always looking for some kind of an adventure. And, uh, well, that's what it's going to get us into this plane here in a minute. I have no idea what the animal situation is here. I haven't seen any. I haven't even seen a bird, which is great. And uh, hopefully they just shoot anything that gets close, although I haven't heard any gunshots either. Uh, but, um, yeah, we'll see. And again, uh, I'm here today with something that clearly is a little bit outside the box for me. It's a 1951 Cessna 170, or uh, specifically a 170A, which is the second iteration of the 170. Um, it's the immediate predecessor to the 172, which is a plane a lot of people will have heard about. It's the most produced airplane in history, 
uh, and it's got a shape nearly as recognizable and as iconic as the Volkswagen Beetle. I mean, we're talking about a pretty famous airplane. Uh, and this one, this 170, it was built to accommodate demand in the booming post-World War II period when makers of military, you know, they tooled up to pump out all these military aircraft. All of a sudden, the war is over. They got to do something. And uh, they started pumping out civilian aircraft. Uh, Cessna had existed for a long time before that. It's a very convoluted history, actually. There was actually a guy named Cessna who was a farmer decided to make airplanes, then he decided to get out of making airplanes, and his cousins decided to take over and make them, and then his son, I mean, a big convoluted history. He went back to farming. Uh, but as a result, his little company became, you know, one of the most prolific, if not the most prolific plane companies uh, in the entire world. So pretty fascinating cat. Um, but anyway, they started pumping out stuff like this to, you know, the GIs came home and, uh, you know, we've done MGs and that sort of thing before, Porsches. They all wanted stuff like that. But there was another set of guys, particularly the ones who ended up doing uh, flying during World War II, that wanted planes. And they wanted affordable, rugged four passenger airplanes to you know fly their families around and have a bit of fun with and uh, the demand for those things were rapidly increasing and this plane was the direct result of that and very specifically it's a four seat single engine high wing monoplane uh, built for general aviation it has a tail dragger landing gear setup which we're going to get into extensively and uh, that differs from the tricycle gear found in the later to come 172 uh, over here is a Cessna 150 or 152. It's a smaller plane, but it has that tricycle gear that I'm talking about. And that's much more traditional and much more of what you see in modern planes. You can see every plane over there, you know, has a tricycle setup, whereas this has the, uh, the two wheels up front and the little tail dragger wheel at the back. And tail draggers, they offer some advantages and disadvantages to a pilot. Um, for one, a tail dragger tends to be safer and more robust as an option for being away from civilization. You know, you got your bush pilot types, you got your guys who want adventures, they fly somewhere to land in a rugged field or a mountaintop where they can sort of see a little runway set up. And the tail dragger is a much better deal for that. It's far simpler uh, than the air oil front struts that, you know, comprise most nose wheel setups and uh, also a nose wheel is heavier so you know the same airplane with a tricycle gear versus a tail dragger gear the tail dragger is going to be a little bit faster and probably the most important thing for landing in these sort of natural scenarios as opposed to a runway is uh, the prop damage I mean if you know the front wheel of a tricycle gear thing goes into a gopher hole, then the prop's going to hit the ground, cause problems, and you're going to be stuck wherever the hell you were. So uh, the tail dragger is a much better setup as far as being, you know, bush pilot territory, you know, where you're out in the wilds of nature. The disadvantage, it costs substantially more to insure a tail dragger uh, now because that's a direct result of the higher rate of incidents, as they call them, uh, in tail, most of them being ground loops, which is a loss of control on the ground. Um, they're somewhat famous for nosing over, you know, particularly in the hands of uh, in an experienced pilot. That's where the front end will dip, the tail will come up, and the thing will end up doing cartwheels down the runway and uh, that's uh, one of the dangers of you know having these things tricycle gear planes they're not immune to that but they're much more stable much more forgiving and uh, frankly that goes with what uh, 172 and the 170 what, what they were all about you know they're meant to be very very forgiving uh, aircraft and uh, the key to the popularity and cult following for this 170 is the first advantage the landing in what I'd call an off-road situation you know the adventurous types who you know again they just want to get in their thing with their you know loved one fly off somewhere that you can't get to by uh, any other vehicle except maybe a helicopter and have a bit of fun with that. And, uh, you know, that's why these things have a bit of a cult following now. Uh, these are very, very good at that in factory form. And then there's these modifications that people make. 
uh, to make them even better at it. You could put a more powerful engine in it that shortens the uh, you know, the takeoff uh, space required. Uh, they put big wheels on it that, you know, make it easier to land on rougher terrain. And, um, you know, the higher front uh, inclination, again, it reduces the propeller strikes on the ground. Uh, you do have to be a bit careful. Apparently landing takes less space than uh, taking off. So, I mean, you can end up landing somewhere and then very quickly realize you don't have enough room to take off again. And uh, if you've done that wrong, you could end up like those soccer players in the Andes who, you know, a few of whom survived only by partaking in kind of some unusual cuisine. But, well, anyway, I like the tail dragger look because it reminds me of the fighter planes of World War II. And I am that simple uh, that something like that makes me uh, happy and excited. Uh, it's a setup that can also be used with skis. You'll see that sometimes for the snow. It could be used with pontoons uh, if you want to land in the water. Uh, but again, you have to be a little bit careful with that. You don't want to end up like that uh, helicopter pilot that got took out by, you know, the great white and Jaws too. So uh, anyway, look, let's just get into this thing. Uh, again, it's the progenitor to the most successful generation, sorry, general aviation plane of all time, uh, which is the 172. And it shared pretty much the identical design. So much of what applies to that applies to this. Uh, and, um, you know, that is, again, the most prolific airplane ever produced. Uh, they're just everywhere. Uh, the wings are called zero height, let's see if I get this right, zero dihedral. And that basically means that they're a perfect horizontal line all the way across. There's no V in them, uh, like you would see in other, you know, if you look over there at that, um, I want to say that's a Cherokee. You can see the wings are sort of V'd, uh, the low wing. This with the high wing, it's just perfectly uh, flat across. And uh, the, on this 170A, the second gen, they're skinned in aluminum. The first generation of this had Wright Brothers style cloth over a skeleton. <laughs> and you know, again, we're talking pretty vintage aircraft here. Uh, this one came out with an aluminum skin, which is much easier for maintenance and uh, just frankly a better overall situation. So the one, you know, the 170As and the 170Bs command a bit more money and respect than the uh, cloth covered 170s, even if the cloth covered ones probably have a little bit more of that vintage appeal. Uh, where the hell am I? So they. The high wing design that you see, you know, the wing up at the top of the plane, it gives tremendous visibility out the windows, which is one of the obvious reasons to even be part of general aviation is the view, you know? You're flying your family around, they can look out the window and they can see just about everything. You get a low wing plane, you know, one at the bottom, well, that big wing kind of blocks some of the view on it and uh, it makes a high wing it's sort of more desirable for search and rescue type stuff or, you know, where good ground visibility is needed. In fact, in 1950, the Army and Air Force, probably the Marines as well and whoever else, began using a military variant of the 170 called the 305 or the 01 Bird Dog. And it was used as a forward air control or reconnaissance aircraft from 1950 to 1974, which is an amazingly long in-service date for a military aircraft. Uh, but of course, that's just because it was rugged and dependable and very good at what it wanted to do. And uh, on top of visibility, the design makes for uh, really excellent stability in the air, which gives it an easy to fly quality that's sort of deeply appreciated by, you know, certainly beginner pilots and even experienced pilots. I mean, the thing, as the guy who took me up yesterday said, it just basically flies itself. And uh, the high wing, again, with the visibility, makes landings a lot easier to judge. And uh, it just becomes a very, very good plane for, uh, you know, for all purposes and for beginners. I mean, more people learn to fly in a 172 than any other type of plane. I mean, it's just, you know, the most, it's, it, it's a perfect plane to have in the flight schools and they're worldwide. You'll see them absolutely everywhere. Uh, more fledgling pilots get their license in a 172 than anything else. And that robustness led to fame and glory for Cessna. Uh, for instance, there was a pilot team, a couple of lunatics. Uh, they set a record for the longest continuous flight. Uh, that was actually, again, a 172, not a 170, but basically the same 
airplane with a few different bits and they stayed aloft for 64 days 19 hours and 22 minutes in 58 and the beginning of 59 it took off in uh, I want to say it was either November or December and I mean these guys are a couple of friggin nut jobs I mean 64 days in the air uh, apparently they got supplies by flying over a car and dropping a uh, rope with a bucket on the end of it to haul it up again. They refueled the same way. Uh, there's a big tanker truck running down the Nevada desert. This thing would fly over it and they'd throw a hose up and refuel it. Uh, there was a mattress in the back and a sink so they could sort of, you know, wash up and, you know, do what they needed to do. And then there's even a platform which would emerge from the doors to that wing strut. Uh, you see the strut there holding up the uh, the wing, supporting it. Well, a platform could come out and they could take a shower in the open air. So, uh, I mean, again, you want to talk about a couple of friggin' nut jobs. It sounds completely terrifying. And uh, frankly, I'm not surprised the record still stands today. I mean, who the hell else wants to do anything like that? Uh, it was also a Cessna that the... Um, that teenage, that German teenage kid, he took off from West Germany and made it through the Soviet Union's rather advanced air defenses at the height of the Cold War. The guy's name was Matthias Rust. Uh, in the name of world peace, he flew from Germany into the Soviet Union and landed at the Red Square. And, you know, it was a big deal. And I think the Soviets beat him to death. Or, uh, well, if they didn't, they probably should have. So. Uh, you know, that was another famous Cessna incident. So, look, it's safe to say that the design is the most successful and fundamentally solid in aviation history. And uh, the vintage nature of the 170 sort of appeals to me. It looks cooler than the later 172. Uh, I love the rounded fins and rudder at the back. Uh, you know, they went to straight edge. You can see that over there in that 150. You know, the, the rear tail fin and the uh, whatever the hell you call them again I'm not a plane guy it's all rounded in this in a very you know vintage sort of way and much straighter and to me not quite as cool uh, as the um, as the other setup uh, you can also see like on that 150 uh, it has this low back with a rear window uh, which was pretty neat at the time and a uh, pretty big deal and 172s eventually shared that uh, this has that high deck in the back with no rear window and again I just think that looks a lot cooler <laughs> the more modern stuff and I mean look you put a radial engine in the front of this thing it's gonna look like the spirit of st. Louis or something it could be a 1920s uh, airplane it's just odd to me it's very very cool uh, the polished uh, aluminum on this one is kind of a popular livery that just again very neat very cool to look at uh, probably a pain in the ass to make happen and maintain but worth every minute of it and um, you know, even if it's occasionally blinding, which it probably is, uh, airplanes are obviously built to be lightweight, and this one comes in at just 1,206 pounds, which is an amazing figure to me. This big thing in front of you weighs less than half of the Miata that I race at Sebring. It just shocks me. Uh, <laughs> 1,206 pounds. Uh, I tell you what, I'm going to pause there for a minute, get my act together. We're going to jump right back into this thing and uh, have a bit of fun with it. So hold on one moment. All right, so you can see the top wing. It's got, you know, marker lights there on the side. It's got these big landing lights uh, there in the middle, which uh, appear to have been upgraded to LED. Uh, this, I'm told, is called the pedo tube. <coughs> Uh, shocking name for something and anyway that that will indicate airspeed I guess when the uh, the wind blows this cover back and then the air goes in there and it tells you how fast it basically covers the speedometer of the car uh, that thing is actually just to hold the door uh, over here this Venturi runs uh, the gyro uh, it sort of spools up a thing that you know gives the planes you know again I'm not a pilot so bear with me for a minute uh, it has a uh, fixed pitch 
uh, two blade propeller, uh, very, very neat stuff. Love the chrome cap on it. Uh, Macaulay is actually a company that Cessna had bought at one point uh, because they were successful enough to do so to sort of make their, they bought a radio company, the Boston Radio Company, and these Macaulay propellers. And, you know, I guess that made the uh, supply easier. Uh, you can see the uh, exhaust pipes there at the bottom, the intakes. There's some of the cylinders with that finned, uh, you know, air cooled thing. Let's have a look in here in the cowling. Put that up without hurting anything. And uh, this is a Continental O300, which is, you know, one of the most prolific and reliable and used engines in general aviation and was made from the, the late 40s, maybe even through today. I mean, it's been made for decades and it's known for its smoothness. It's the uh, one that came after what was called the C145 engine, same design, puts out 145 horsepower. It's six cylinders in a boxer shape. That means the pistons sort of come out horizontally like they do in a Porsche or Subaru. Uh, you know, because airplane, they have a lot of design constraints and room constraints. It's easier to put a, a flat engine in a boxer engine than it would be a V formation. So um, you see these uh, boxer engines in airplanes much more commonly. You also see them in the back of airboats and stuff. Uh, but it's a very simple engine, very uh, easy to run, very good on maintenance, has adequate power. You know, again, people tend to, uh, you know, fancy guys that want to upgrade these things to give them even more juice. Uh, but the one in this is perfectly adequate and uh, definitely is, you know, one of the most tried and true uh, airplane engines in aviation history. So let's have a look inside. No step there on that thing. I don't know if I should sit in or I had the seat belt on to make the, yeah, there we go. There's the tail fins going down. Uh, I tell you what, let me pause for a sec. I'll hop in and uh, then we'll have a little tour of the cockpit. Well, first of all, before I hop in, see the two seats. This was a big deal having uh, back seats and you got a little bit of storage capacity back there. Uh, some guys take the back seats out because they don't have children. They were smart that way and that gives them a little bit more luggage room and whatnot. Uh, but either way, you could have four passengers in this thing and, you know, be fairly happy. Uh, I loved this. I had these open on the runway yesterday. Uh, <laughs> That windows that look like they're out of a 1950s motorhome. Uh, and this just, this little keeper was the only thing preventing the door from opening on me. I didn't lock it. I don't even know if the lock works. So a little terrifying to see that now, but very, very cool the way that all opens up. Uh, but anyway, let me pause it. I'm going to hop in the, uh, uh, God, you can't call it the driver's side of the plane. I think in the, Helicopters, right seat is the command seat, and in airplanes, it's left seat, and I'm gonna stick with that, but, all right, I can't do this while holding a camera, so bear with me one moment. All right, so, oh my God, so here we are, that door open. Uh, okay, here we go, they, again, I sort of had to brush up on all this stuff, not being a pilot. The only stuff I ever picked up was like from the movie Airplane, or whatnot, so. Uh, this is the original, dash, if you will, in uh, in this 1951 model. And you can see it's very cool. And as I said, and it again, it just reminded me of being in some kind of a World War II airplane. I just thought it was amazing. Uh, these little skinny yokes, as they're called, uh, you see they match on both sides there with the wrap tape. And, uh, you know, they control basically the steering of the aircraft. Uh, down there, you've got your two pedals. They control the... Um, uh, the tail rudder in the back and also braking. So uh, pushing them without tilting them is the uh, rudder. You tilt them in and it's the brakes. And uh, you could hit either brake more severely than the other one. So, you know, if you need to control yourself on the ground, you could use the brakes to do it. Uh, getting down here, you have the flaps. That's this big emergency brake looking thing. Uh, if I pull that, you can see it raises and lowers the flaps, which gives the wing more lift for landing. Uh, this roller wheel is called trim. 
uh, that uh, controls the um, uh, the two air, air ailerons in the back, and you set it up so the plane flies neutrally, and you don't have to, you know, if it wants to tilt up or tilt down, you can adjust this thing uh, based on wind flow, and it'll keep the plane nice and level. Uh, you also have your fuel tank control down there to switch between the two 21-gallon tanks. Uh, apparently, not all of these had uh, in-cabin communications from the factory. This one did, uh, which is nice. You can see the little factory um, plugs there for the headsets, and you know that lets the pilot talk to the tower and the people inside the cabin talk to each other. And uh, there's two uh, uh, for the back passengers as well. Uh, there you see the owner's manual, which I'd have to rip out to be able to start the thing up and fly it around. Uh, getting into the controls, I don't know all of these, but I know this is your radio uh, and nav stuff that. Um, uh, you know, you can use, I, I think this one he said was IFR capable, which is rare for a little plane like this. So that's kind of neat. Uh, but anyway, that's obviously all been upgraded since the 1950s where this stuff hasn't. And that gives you your airspeed. Uh, this is your pitch control or, you know, gimbal. It shows you whether you're banking left or right. Uh, you got to get planes landed over there. Uh, this is your altitude. Uh, it tells you how high you are up off the ground. This tells you your compass. It's your direction. It works in tandem with that somehow. Uh, your vertical speed up and down. Uh, this is a gimbal controlled, you know, attitude control. Again, don't beat me up if I'm wrong. I'm going from memory here. That's your engine RPM. You got your exhaust manifold temperature. Uh, you got your suction. I can't remember what the hell you need suction for. Uh, this is the overall engine temperature. This is your oil pressure. You got a wind up clock, eight day clock. Very cool. And uh, this plane actually has an alternator instead of just a generator, which is supposedly a big deal. Don't know why, but it does. Uh, they call these piano keys, and they're basically, um, you know, just toggle switches that you could turn on your uh, your radio, you could turn on your nav lights, strobe lights, landing lights, that sort of thing. Uh, this has something to do with the nav, which I don't remember. Uh, this is your throttle, push-pull. I wonder if this is all Bakelite from the 50s. It could very well be. Uh, parking brake, cabin heat. This is actually how you start the plane, which I'm, I was so tempted to pull. No, I'm not going to do it. I think I'd actually start up and fly into a building. Uh, this turns on the magnetos, which will actually get the plane running. Uh, up here, you've got your wing tank. So um, on this side, it tells you the amount of fuel left in your uh, right tank. On this side, in your left tank. So uh, all very neat stuff. This is just a little map light. Uh, these are air vents. This will blow in air on you. And uh, also tells you your air temperature over there. And one of the, you know, great joys of these planes is the visibility out, you know, not just the sides, not just the back, but even over the cowling. You know, when you're flying, you have tremendous visibility in this thing. And uh, when you're landing, it makes it just that much easier because you're able to sort of see the ground beside you and you can uh, judge it. Uh, this is a very nice place to put some sort of a handgun. Uh, I remember a story about a guy named Dave, uh, Toothless Dave, very, very interesting cat. He was a bush pilot in Alaska. Uh, he landed there for the first time, you know, decades ago, uh, was met after landing by one of the fish and wildlife guys at the airport who asked him if he had a gun on him and uh, Dave very properly answered no he did not and the guy was horrified and said well, look that's a problem we got to get you to the gun store uh, you know it's required that you have some sort of big bore pistol on hand to take care of any bears or whatnot <laughs> so he had to go out and buy a gun uh, I love him for that uh, you know the Canadians in the back they're going to be fairly chipper you don't have a ton of like room but you got some and to my absolute joy uh, you have four individual ashtrays in this plane from here to here to here to here and uh, you know so in the 50s when people smoked uh, that's um, you know nice way civilized way to live uh, my understanding is Patrick Swayze once crashed his airplane into a residential community he lived but he crashed and the reason was that nicotine had gummed up all the controls uh, that's if I remember right. Don't hold me to it. You might want to Google it, but uh, apparently he enjoyed uh, partaking in uh, quite a bit of smoking as he was flying and maybe even a few beer cans. So anyway, there's a quick tour of the cockpit. Very cool stuff. They call it the cockpit, of course, because that's where the pilots sit. And... Um, 
you know, very neat. So what I'm going to do is get out, uh, give you another quick view of the plane. Try not to, oh my God, crash into us. I've had a little bit too much coronavirus whiskey this morning. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to pause there. Uh, I'll get the cowling back down and then I'm going to interject um, the flight that I did yesterday with uh, a very nice, again, 104 year old gentleman with tremendous hand tremors. And um, we'll put that in there. So bear with me one moment.
there it is. And you know, the gentleman who flew us, again, very well put together for being 103 years old, uh, I believe it was the uncle of uh, famed aviator Charles Lindbergh and was even briefly suspected of kidnapping the baby. But uh, when it turned out it wasn't him, he was cleared and as such was here to give me a quick fly around above the beautiful Albert Witted and as you saw with some really attractive views of St. Pete and Tampa Bay. And uh, I'm not gonna lie and say his severe hand tremors didn't add to the terror that I was already feeling. Uh, but all went well, even if the landing was a bit bumpy and, uh, you know, the pilot did briefly confuse me for a guy in a foxhole with him in World War II. So there, there is that. But anyway, there you have it. Uh, my first and quite probably last review of an airplane on this car dedicated channel. Uh, I'm pleased it could be on a plane that's sort of this cool and this vintage, you know, and must say that despite shitting my pants, it was a tremendous amount of fun. And uh, I want to thank the owner of the plane for giving me the opportunity. And uh, hopefully, even though it's well outside the box, you guys had a bit of fun getting a tour of a pretty neat old vintage airplane. So thanks for having a look. Really appreciate it. Going to try and come up with some more fun stuff for later. Back to cars. And uh, we'll keep the ball rolling. So take care. Have a good one. And uh, look at that. There's an old Boeing uh, Stearman biplane, I believe, in the back with a radial engine open cockpit. It's got to be kind of a fun way to tour the city, at least during the morning hours when it's nice. You feel like you're Snoopy in a sop with camel or something, but yeah, it's pretty neat stuff. But anyway, thanks for having a look. Don't think I'm going to get into aviation. I'll let my rich friends do that while I continue to be impoverished, impoverished and miserable and coursing through the day the way I do. Take care and we will see you at the next one.